Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. I am your host, Josh Cohen, host of the Unfiltered Podcast and the Underground. Uh, this week, I have the great pleasure of speaking with Dr. Dr. Jacob M. Appel. Uh, Dr. Appel is an American author, poet, bioethicist, physician, lawyer, and social critic. He is best known for his short stories, his work as a playwright, and his writing in the fields of reproductive ethics, organ donation, neuroethics, and euthanasia. Appel's novel, The Man Who Wouldn't Stand Up, won the Dundee International Book Prize in 2012. He is the director of the Ethics Education in, Soci in Psychiatry at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York City. Appel is the subject of the 2019 documentary film, uh, Jacob, uh, by, which was directed by uh, Mr. John Stahl. Um, he has an impressive litany of degrees, which I encourage you to go to his website, uh, jacobmappel.com, to, uh, to look at. Um, Appel also writes for both the Huffington Post and Opposing views. He has staked out a libertarian position of many bioethical issues, advocating a worldview that he describes as a culture of liberty. He has also authored opinion pieces in, big deep breath here, uh, the New York Times, the New York Daily News, New York Post, Chicago Tribune, Orlando Sentinel, Albany Times Union, Tucson Citizen, Detroit Free Press, New Haven Register, Baltimore Sun, and the Providence Journal. Uh, the Best American Essays series named his nonfiction pieces as notable essays in the years 2011, 2012, 2013, 2015, and 2017, and received special mention from the Pushcart Prize in 2012 and 2017. I spoke with him for a little over 40 minutes. It was such a pleasure, and I really hope you enjoy. Thank you. Well, hey, I, I tell you what, uh, Jacob, I know you're a busy guy. I'd love to just jump right into it, if that's okay with you. Sure, ab absolutely. Awesome, thank you, Jacob. So, um, I'd like to start, obviously, at the beginning. You're many things, been called many things. Uh, you're a bioethicist, you're a poet, you're an attorney, among many others. I'm quite anxious to know, Jacob, how do you think you would describe yourself? Uh, how would I describe myself? Well, I always tell people my mother describes me as her son who's not the rabbi, which probably <laughs> says a lot. Uh, it, it reveals the expectations raised and not achieved. Um, but that being said, I actually think of myself as a pretty ordinary, decent person. Um, I would like to think of myself as a good friend and a generous human being. Oh, I like that. I like that. Thank you. Um, Listing your educational pedigree is a daunting task, uh, Jacob, but I'll, I'll have to press on. Um, you have an MFA from NYU, you have a JD from Harvard, an MA from Brown, and many other degrees. In plain words, I should like to ask you, what was it that made you want to pursue such a high level of learning in all these various fields? Well, I mean, the first thing to remember is people are often impressed by that, but it's the, the wizard says to the scarecrow, we can't give you a brain, but we can give you a diploma. So <laughs> the, the worry of people who have lots of fancy degrees, um, one could argue that we're in this crisis right now and lots of people who have fancy degrees didn't do anything to keep us from getting there. So right. that all being said, um, I really like learning and I really like school. And I tell people that if you don't appreciate how great school is, you need to go back to school to learn that. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I mean, I just say, I think there's something to be said for knowledge for its own sake, but it's also something to be said for learning different things that can be integrated well together. Mm -hmm. And my real interests are in medical humanities and bioethics, and, and the degrees I've gotten all sort of here in that direction. Okay. So it's not that I chose nine random different subjects to study. I chose a number of subjects that actually very closely relate to each other or triangulate on a particular career path. Okay. Very cool. No, Jacob, thank you. Um, do you mind if I ask? I, I hope you'll forgive the question if you must, and I'm happy to press on, but just the, the curiosity simply has the best of me. Um, do you mind if I ask how you financed your college careers? Oh, sure. So a lot of it was, well, I got lucky in the sense that because my father is a college professor and has been teaching for a very long time, some of it is funded through his university. Um, mm. So I, I some tuition benefit. And then I found a fair amount of scholarship money early on. But then also, I've been working as a physician for a long time now, so um, a lot of these degrees were earned while I was working as a physician. Oh, okay, interesting. Um, uh, capping off, so, um, so if, the tax if the taxpayers are worried if they're paying for my education, they don't need to fear that. Sure, understood. Um, uh, just to cap off our discussion regarding uh, the, the various degrees, uh, your pedigree, sir, uh, you'll have to forgive the cliched form, uh, I, have to f <laughs> I have to form this question, but achieving all those degrees certainly takes an incredible amount of determination and persistence. Uh, I'd be quite curious to know, what do you think drove you to, uh, to want to achieve these? 
Um, well, I'm a psychiatrist. My answer to that is my answer to everything. It's yes. deep-seated tension, deep seated tension of inadequacy and a desire to fill the, the gaps and holes in early childhood that one doesn't remember. <laughs> um, I'm, uh, but I would have asked you that to almost any question you ask. So. <laughs> it's true, isn't it? Um, yeah, that's what psychiatrists do. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I might ask for a head examination before we're done here. <laughs> um, I'm more than a little excited to... I see you're probably the sanest person I'm going to talk to all week. I can tell that already. Really? Yeah. Wow. I, mean, I, I, I work with psychiatric patients, so I can tell normal from not normal. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I, uh, I'm more than a little excited to discuss writing with you, uh, Jacob. I, I write myself. I'm a publishing columnist with a few humble uh, online magazines, and I write essays on my blog. <clears throat> Excuse me. You've written uh, slightly more than I have. <laughs> 17 books, 10 plays, numerous short stories, among many, many others. Uh, when did you realize that you had a passion for writing, and were there any authors that inspired you early on? So, I guess I sort of really figured out I liked writing in fifth grade. Um, we had in volumes and volumes of books in my house. My grandfather, my, my mother's father, who I never met, belonged to one of those, maybe several of those, clubs where they would send you a bunch of books every week. Mm. Um, and, and they sent books on every random subject you could imagine. So I, I remember he had somebody, some, one of them that sent a book on the life cycle of the ants. And he actually <laughs> read all these books. I have no idea. Like, it was sort of like a, a, a self-taught man in South Coast nausea who just reads randomly. He must have read randomly. When I was hmm. a kid, I was fascinated by this, and I would just read the books randomly. Um, none of the knowledge is stuck with me, but sort of the interest in knowledge and learning did stick with me, and I, I loved writing as a kid. And then when I went to law school, um, and I was interested in becoming a bioethicist. That's why I went to law school. Um, anybody who has been a first-year law student starts thinking of what else they can do with their life. And so I started writing more seriously and sending out my work. Hmm. Did you... Um careful how I phrase this, um, how would you describe your writing style? Do you have a particular form that you find that your prose takes? Well, I think the, the underlying theme, and it's sort of relevant to the, the times we live in now, is I like to write about what I do psychiatrically, which is the, the realization that all of us work, walk very, very close to an edge all the time, mm. and, or at least reasonably close, some of us closer than others. But it's always the possibility that something will push us toward the edge or push us off. And my characters are all about getting pushed just a bit too close to the edge, and some topple and some hold on. And so that's the underlying theme of much of my writing. Um, in terms of style, um, people often ask that. I think a better way to think of it is I'm, I'm not a realist in the sense that the world I inhabit is not a world we live in on a daily basis. Right. But I'm also not writing true magical realism. This is not Gabriel Garcia Marquez. This is somewhere in a world that could be, but isn't. Okay, interesting. Um, your first book, uh, I'm very anxious to talk to you about, uh, The Man Who Wouldn't Stand Up, was published in 2012 by Cargo Publishing, and it won the many awards, the International Rubri uh, Book Award and the highly sought after Dundee International Book Prize. And it tells the story of a rather unspectacular, I would say botanist, at a Yankees game with his nephew, who refuses to stand for the national anthem. And uh, for our mutual audience, Excuse me, for our mutual audience, Jacob, uh, it's worth knowing this is published long before the escapades of uh, Colin Kaepernick, right? So, Absolutely. Uh, yes, sir. So my question will take two forms. Uh, number one, how did you decide on the subject matter of that particular book? And then two, why do you think it received such a claim? Why do you think it hit such a cultural chord? Well, so the, so the subject matter for most of my books, I try to, part of the subtext of my writing is always cultural commentary. And there's a certain instinctive anti-authoritarian nature in my, my psyche and my writing. Um, or to criticize the the way we all do things, to make us rethink the norm. Um, so I, I, I want to emphasize to people, my, my goal of this book is not to question patriotism or the wonderful things that those people who are in our service do for us. It's a question of false patriotism. Hmm. And I remember many, many years ago, sitting at a baseball game, um, and all of these drunken fools were thinking the Star Spangled Banner. None of them had any idea what its history was, what its meaning was, all the sacrifice made for it, what a rampart is. And there was one older gentleman who was not standing up, and somebody started jeering him. And I was thinking, nobody knows why this man is standing up. He could be disabled, he could be Canadian, he could be a Jehovah's Witness. 
And it reminded me that, like, I mean, seriously, there are all sorts of good reasons not to stand up at a baseball game, even if you're the most deeply patriotic soul in the world. <laughs> um, so, knowing that, um, I then about a year later figured I would do it myself, and I went to a baseball game with a friend, and I didn't stand up. And I gotta tell you, it was extremely uncomfortable. Um, people gave you dirty looks, several people shouted, um, and, and I gotta tell you, I was looking around the crowd and thinking, these are not the people who are going to defend our nation in a foxhole uh, when we really need it done or yes. stand up for the Commonwealth. These are people who are going to be cowering in their homes complaining that their baseball season was canceled. So <laughs> that's sort of where the book came from. Maybe that's a little bit cynical, but I, I, I really deeply believe in true service and, and helping the country and just not people who, who pay a lip service to it, but I really don't mean it. Yeah. No, I absolutely. That's the second part of the question. Though. What was the second part of the question? I apologize. Say it one more time. I'm sorry. <laughs> So we get two part question, and I only answered the first half, and I lost track of the second half. Um, well, let's see. Uh, the second bit was, uh, why do you think it received such a claim? Oh, so it's interesting. It actually didn't. Uh, even though it won a handful of literary awards, I had very much hoped that all the furor and fanfare over people not standing at sporting events would have drawn attention to the book. And yes. it didn't. And I actually sent copies of the book to a large number of people interested in that subject, sports commentators, never heard a word back. Nothing. So if you have any uh, insight into that or any connections, I still think it's relevant to that debate. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, no, I would agree, sir. I would uh, feel as you do. Um, moving on uh, through your anthology, uh, Jacob, in 2014, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Scouting for the Reaper, your first collection of short stories, was published by Black Lawrence Publishing. Um, among the stories in the collection, Ad Valorum, first published in Subtropics, uh, was named a distinguished mystery story in the best American mystery stories of 2009. Now, gosh, you'll have to forgive the fashionable term here, uh, Jacob, but how would you describe your process, as it were, as a short story writer? Is there any advice you would care to give to someone like me, who's an aspiring writer? Sure. So the two things I tell people, both in terms of writing processing and in terms of um, building a writing career. The writing process advice I always give people is there are different styles of writing, a different approach. You know, but something that works naturally for you, don't let my words dissuade you. But if you're mm -hmm. sort of at a loss, I always think it's much better to do a lot more thinking before you start writing. Grace mm -hmm. Kelly used to say, uh, the short story writer, she did her best writing in the bathtub. And she didn't mean that she brought her quill pen and her parchment into the bathtub, um, or I guess now her laptop. She meant she thought through what she was going to do. Because that helped her figure out where her destination was in the story. Hmm. I noticed that there are things you should sit down and write, and it works for a few people. I think for most people, the analogy I like to draw is taking your kids on vacation. And there are three ways you can do it. One thing you can do is you can just put your kids in a car and drive and see where you end up. And you might end up simply great, but you're probably going to end up with a lot of very upset kids. Or two, which some people do, you can keep telling your kids you're going to go on vacation and never do it. And those are the few people who never actually put pen to paper, and their kids eventually get very disappointed and unhappy. But the third approach is to figure out where you want to go and buy tickets and book a motel room and all of that. And that's the way to do it. To figure out where you want to go with your story, think about it through, make a plan, and then write the story. Hmm. Interesting. And in terms of career advice, what I always tell people is sort of like you should never in the hospital die in one doctor's opinion. Um, <laughs> you should never be discouraged by one or two editors. Um, be relentless. Keep sending out your work. Um, I've had many stories that were rejected 50 times, 100 times, accepted by a very reputable journal. In one case, I, I, I shouldn't mention which journal, I'm going to be on good behavior. A journal that turned down my story a year later, a different editor accepted the exact same story. Hmm. Really? Yeah. Wow. So, um, no, that's fascinating. I, uh, yeah, well, and I was watching, uh, it was the Big Think interview you gave uh, some years back, and I actually watched the, the documentary, which we'll, we'll discuss um, a few days ago. And uh, I actually wouldn't mind touching for just perhaps a, mi a minute on the idea of rejection. Um, one of my favorite, uh, I'll, uh, very quick um, uh, comment from me, and then I'll, I'll kick it over to you, sir. Uh, my favorite rejection story would have to be George Orwell. He uh, submits his manuscript for Animal Farm, right, to uh, a publishing house that's actually run by T.S. Eliot at the time, and he uh, gets a rejection letter, and it says, um, it says, uh, we just can never see uh, a story where the main characters are animals. <laughs> that would just never fly. <laughs> and to have this exactly. in the to have this in the country of Disney, I think, is an extraordinary, uh, such a fatuous comment would be made, right? Um, so, uh, 
what are your thoughts on rejection? How do you handle rejection, to coin a, a phrase? Um, so the way I like to think of it is if you only have one story or novel under your submission, or you think of yourself as a project-based writer, then you're going to be really disappointed when you get rejected. But if you have a lot of stories in the works that are under submission, um, then one, submission, one rejection doesn't hurt as much. It's sort of like if you stand on one pin, it hurts really, really badly. But mm. if you stand on a thousand pins placed really, really close together, you barely feel it. Sure. That makes sense. Volume. Um, Volume. Yeah. Uh, I wonder, um, in terms of your uh, prolificism, <laughs> proliferation, try that word, um, as a writer, do you have a goal for how many words you like to write in a week, say, when you're, when you're scorching as a writer? There's enormous variability. Um, yeah. I can tell you, like, when I have a, quite a few weeks, I can get a lot of writing done. Right now, I'm in an emergency room position in the middle of the COVID epidemic. I'm getting very little writing done. Okay. Interesting. Um, excuse me. I read your essay, uh, Miracles and Conundrums of the Secondary Planets, uh, just yesterday, as a matter of fact. And, uh, yeah. I, yeah, and I, I adored it. I love the, the, the structure. I love the quirkiness. I love the, um, uh, I mean this in the best possible way, Jacob, the outlandishness of the prose. Um, Thank you. Yeah, you're very welcome indeed. Um, and uh, I think I should like to ask you, perhaps you could tell our audience uh, briefly, what's, the, what's the, the structure of the story? And I would very much love, what, how, did you, how did you come up with that idea? That's an extraordinary idea. So in the, with, with a caveat that I've written, I've published now several hundred stories. Mm -hmm. um, so it's been a long time since I've written this or even read it. Miracles Conundrums of a Secondary Planet is about a alien, um, an extraterrestrial, who is sent by his home planet to study the ways of normal human beings. Um, and they disguise him as a lackey and restaurateur in an Alabama city. Um, and unfortunately, for, for their mission, an abortion clinic opens up next door and a protest starts. And he is seeing a very skewed end of what it means to be a human being in America. Okay. And then he, then he, falls, then he falls in love, or I should refer to this, then a romantic possibility arises with one of the protesters. Sure. Fascinating, and uh, and perhaps maybe you already answered. And if, if you did, I'll just move on. But how did you uh, arrive at that subject matter? How did you come up with the idea? Um, I think it, rather than coming up with a particular idea, pieces come from different places. And then some at some point you're thinking, and suddenly all the pieces merge. I always mm. knew I wanted to write write a, an abortion story in a bioethicist, but I didn't want to write a traditional pro-choice, pro-life, that kind of thing. I wanted to write something that sort of viewed how odd our debates over abortion are. I was thinking about, like, what vantage point could you tell that from? And finally, an alien being seemed the most obvious. Um, yeah. And then I asked myself, how would an alien being disguise himself? And somehow the idea of a, a Latvian restaurateur um, seemed like the ultimate disguise for anyone. Hmm. Interesting. And, and, and on top of that, you also, I got to learn a lot about interesting different Latvian foods that he might serve in his restaurant. <laughs> Understood. Um, I'm curious, in, in terms of uh, the, the process of writing, I, I hate to keep bringing it back to, to George Orwell, but he had an ethic where he would try and arrest the reader with a, an incredible opening statement, opening sentence. In 1984, he'll say, you know, it was a bright, cold day in April and all the clocks struck 13, right? Very good way of seizing the, writer's, the reader's attention. Um, and uh, the opening sentence of Miracles and Conundrums of the Secondary Planets, uh, I'm paraphrasing somewhat, um, was that the... Uh, the protagonist um, didn't really have a name because on his planet, names were superfluous. Uh, was there a thought or process that guided you towards that opening sentence? Is that too, is that an odd question? It's not an odd question, but the truth is, I, it happened so long ago, I can't put the phrase together. Sure. But it just strikes me, because I, I do a lot of teaching with medical students and college students. Orwell's opening line in 1984 is brilliant, and someday nobody will understand it. Um, someday, in the world of uh, digital clocks, but analog is gone. The idea of a clock striking or a clock hitting 13 will be perfect. Clock striking will be incomprehensible, and all mm. clocks will be at 13 at some point. Hmm. That's an interesting That's point. Kind of I haven't thought of that. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, well, I, I tell you, I, I could discuss writing with you all day, sir, but uh, I know we're on we're on the time. Uh, so, uh, I think I'd like to press on. Certainly, as you've you've mentioned. 
excuse me, your work as a bioethicist, uh, Jacob. Uh, in a piece you wrote for the New York Times uh, back in 2018, you wrote, and I'll quote you directly, bioethics is a broad interdisciplinary field. Its subject matter encompass encompasses many of the most controversial and weighty matters facing contemporary society, including aid in dying or assisted suicide, human cloning, abortion, artificial reproduction, genetic engineering, organ transplantation, medical marijuana, and healthcare rationing, end quote. Um, how would you describe the day-to-day -day of a practicing bioethicist? So I think there are three distinct things bioethicists do. Um, one thing they do is they serve on committees and hospitals and see individual patients. And I do very little of that right now. Um, I see patients clinically for, for psychiatry, but doing, offering ethical advice to patients and doctors in the hospital. I mean, I've done in the past, but not at the moment. The mm. second thing they do is they, uh, they write commentary and try to influence public opinion um, or offer advice on bioethical issues, which is confidence going on right now at, at the highest levels in the context of the ongoing pandemic. Um, and then they do a lot of teaching and help young doctors and, and clinicians think about ethical issues so they can bring it back to, to their, their own patients and their own, own practices. So I do a substantial amount of bioethics writing and I do a lot of teaching, teaching doctors, teaching residents, teaching medical students, how to think about ethical issues. Hmm. Hmm. Got it. I, um, yeah, I suppose uh, inevitably we can't quite duck the issue of uh, COVID-19, can we? Um, I wish we could, believe me. Yeah, I'm, I'm right there with you, Jacob, trust me. <laughs> um, but uh, it'd be foolish to ignore it. Uh, as a practicing bioethicist, I'm curious, do you have a line on how America's responded to COVID-19? Do you have any, any uh, thoughts there? Well, I think the, the, the answer I tell people is nobody, nobody knows how this will play out. Anybody who tells you they know anything right now is either deluding themselves or lying. But it's an example of how we need to have more bioethic education. We need to think about these issues as a society well in advance. Mm -hmm. um, this is, to, to paraphrase what has been said about 9-11, um, a failure of imagination, I mean, a failure of our, or a failure to respond to imagination, a failure of our leaders, our thinkers, to think about what could happen. But that being said, once we get through this, and we will get through this, there are a whole host of other significant challenges facing us as human beings that people don't think about um, that will also be failures of imagination when they happen, unless they kill us all. Um, so there's nothing wrong with talking about climate change, but somehow it takes all of the air in the room away from other threats to humanity. Um, two that come up top of my head, which people don't think about, are the risk of an electromagnetic storm, like the Carrington event of the 1850s, that could melt the grid, that is mm. a high risk and something we could prevent, um, and true antibiotic resistance occurring at a mass scale, which would put medicine back to the 19th century. And both of those things are things we can address and we can probably prevent, but not if we don't think about them. Yes. Yes, understood. Um... Uh, yeah, uh, no, I appreciate that, uh, Jacob. Um, one question I was uh, terribly curious to ask you, <clears throat> excuse me, after I cough, <laughs> is uh, in an interview with Big Think back in 2012, which we mentioned earlier, you said that you would consider the screening of embryos in a fertility clinic for a deaf embryo because a potential parent values deaf culture as child abuse. Do I have you uh, paraphrased appropriately there, sir? I think a better way to think about it is, because I, I try not to take normative positions. Yes. Um, that you want to ask yourself whether screening embryos to make them deaf is any different from having the procedure done in utero once the baby's already conceived, or once the fetus is conceived. And if you think that's, if you think that, if you think that it's okay to choose a deaf embryo when you're hearing an embryo available, how is that different from having them implant a hearing embryo and then doing surgery in utero or another technique in utero to make the future child deaf? And if that's different, how is that different from making the child deaf surgically the instant it's born before it hears anything. Uh, <laughs> and my argument is that one can debate whether or not one or the other is at the right point to draw, the, whether one or the other um, is ethical, but they're really all the same thing. They have the same outcome, and we're playing word games, and we try to treat them differently. Okay, interesting. No, I, thank you. I appreciate you clarifying that. Um, and with that in mind, uh, Jacob, in that same interview, to quote you uh, directly, uh, you said that you had the... Uh, uh, radical opinion that you would permit abortion up until the point of birth, correct? Right. Okay. So here's my question. I don't mean to debate you on the matter. I'm just engage you on it. I'm genuinely curious. Uh, my sure. 
Thank you, thank you. M my question is, is there any sort of moral conflict that you see um, given that the former example would seem to presuppose conferring personhood or sentience onto the embryo? Sure, so, so there's the two thoughts I would offer. When I, I do always like to emphasize this. One of the great faults of our society is that people are able to take a bare vantage point without realizing that people who disagree with them are simply people who start with different premises and are still people of goodwill rather than being fools or evil people. And there are many people who believe that life as we should preserve it begins at conception and abortion is, is deeply wrong. And I very much respect that. They are not evil people. They are not people of bad will. They are people who simply start with different premises and, and different values and reach different conclusions. And I think we're never going to make any progress talking about these issues until we actually recognize the, the goodwill in each other's views. Um, with, with that in mind, um, I think the, the concern is what the child once the child acquires sentience and pe personhood is like. So while I am perfectly fine with people aborting a child before it becomes something sentient that we want to preserve as a human being, I'd be very disturbed if people did things to that embryo or that fetus that when it were born and did become a human being um, had significant disabilities or disadvantages in life or suffered in some way. Um, so if, if you want to go home and drink heavily during your pregnancy and give your child fetal alcohol syndrome, and create a lower quality of life for it, that would disturb me very, very greatly. Uh, so moving on, I'd like to discuss, um, there was one piece of the documentary I saw, uh, of Jacob obviously, um, which seized me. And I, I'd like to um, maybe dig in and, and uh, analyze and get your thoughts on it. Um, let me see, uh, is it true that you advocated for putting lithium in the water? Could you explain that uh, to our viewers? Ah, so that's sort of a, a it's an accurate but misinterpretation. So it's there's yes. data, and actually a lot of data now, that trace amounts of lithium in the drinking water. Not the amounts, by the way, that we use like to treat patients with bipolar disorder, but more like the equivalent of like an eyedropper in a swimming pool. Um, substantially reduce the suicide rate of people who grow up in areas where there's that naturally occurring lithium. Nobody's adding it's naturally there. And a large portion of the world already has that natural occurring lithium in the drinking water. So hmm. what I suggested, based on that, and not just me, a lot of other prominent people, is we should study and make sure this is true, and then we should think about, try to find out whether there are any limited aspects of having this naturally occurring lithium. And if there aren't, then, sort of like we add fluoride to the water, we should think about whether we want to add trace amounts of lithium. Now, the two arguments to think about, or why this is much less problematic than people think, are you have no idea right now whether you live in an area where there's naturally occurring lithium in the water or not. Um, it's not the reason people buy homes. It's not even something you can easily find out on your own. So it's not like people have made this a conscious choice. They just they're probably even not even aware of it. And secondly, very few people would think it unethical if for other reasons we diverted the water supply from one area to another, we used a different aquifer or a different dam in your area, and you got a different supply of water that happened to have lithium versus not have lithium. And if that's okay, then why not adding trace amounts everywhere um, would be any different. It's puzzling to me. Um, so a lot of people sort of misinterpret that academic, scientific argument to suggest that I'm telling you if you should buy lithium in the stores and fill the water with it, which is an <laughs> asinine idea. And, and most people, I mean, a lot of things that I say, um, because I write about controversial subjects, you can choose one particularly controversial aspect of it and roll with it, or you can actually think about what I'm saying, which people sometimes <laughs> have a hard time doing. Yeah, there's the idea of um, scoring uh, scoring points uh, just for the sake of scoring points. Then there's the idea of actually picking up a, an idea, analyzing it, look, walking around it, looking at it from all angles, and seeing if it's something viable. Um, right, and I, 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 it's not a slam dunk that we should do this. It's also possible that there are invisible or unrecognized negative consequences. Like people who live in areas with naturally occurring lithium might be less creative, and we might not know that yet. And we want to think about the negative implications too, and figure out how much of a difference it makes for suicide to see whether, as a society, it's worth a trade-off. Sure, understood. So, uh, as a bioethicist, um, in the documentary you mentioned yourself, uh, you, you describe yourself more as a, as a libertarian. Um, would, that be, would that still be a true statement? Would you describe yourself as a libertarian bioethicist? Very much so. I, I'm not necessarily libertarian in my general views of the world, but in terms of mm -hmm. bioethics, I very much am. I think it's the, the job of bioethicists is to stand out of the way and let science progress and let medical research progress unless there's a compelling reason to intervene. I think, unfortunately, if you give a person a hammer, all problems become nails. And some of my colleagues <laughs> in bioethics, they, they now have this tool of, of ethical discernment and they start saying to people, this is unethical, that is unethical, without really 
thinking about why they're putting the brakes on things. So I'm very reluctant to put brakes on things unless we're really pretty sure they're concerning. Hmm. Yes, understood. Um, so then perhaps we can touch maybe very briefly uh, on the political dimension. Um, in, in plain words, um, where do you see the role of government in American society? Limited, I presume? Um, well, I think all of us believe that government is useful at some point where the vast majority is insightful people because we want the, the roads paved and we want the country protected. And most of us don't believe in government to be extreme because we've read 1984 and we know what they can do. Um, mm. And what I tell people is rather than having a, a one size fits all ideology, which unfortunately our system is designed for, we want to think about which, which things governments do well and which things governments do really, really badly. Um, and there are some areas of the healthcare system, for example, the government is probably very good at doing, and others the government is not very good at doing, and, and the same with other collective action problems. Um, so I, I, I think a, a classic example would be um, if we ask every individual through the marketplace simply to choose which medications to fund and which research to, to pursue, we probably would have a very irrational patchwork. So having some centralized process for figuring out which scientific research makes the most sense to achieve the best end a, a very useful government function. Sure, understood. Um, and with that in mind, Jacob, uh, I'd like to throw a scenario at you and just kind of get your your thoughts on it. Um, are you familiar with BC? Uh, excuse me, with Bill C seventeen? No, is that, is that federal? Is that state? Um, it actually is uh, Canadian uh, legislation. Um, uh, I, I'm not. Yeah, n no problem. So what it is is it was uh, leg it was an amendment that was uh, given to basically the human rights legislation in Canada, uh, effectively allowing if you misgender somebody, right, you have a biological man that identifies as a woman, you call uh, that person a, a man, that therefore it's a violation, it's a, it's a hate crime and thus a violation of human rights. Um, in my view, what this effectively amounts to is what Jordan Peterson called compelled speech, right, government compelling speech out of, out of the individual. Um, in plain words, following that uh, scenario, do you think a person's right to speech should supersede a person's right not to be offended? So that's a very broad statement. So to yes, parse it of down, course. I think on the whole, we want to preserve pe people's right to speak. And on the whole, the right to quote unquote not be offended raises the possibility of a heckler's veto and it's a very, very concerning yes. um, way of going about things. That being said, I, I always say this whenever I do an interview of any sort, I'm sure there are some scenario you can think of in some rare situation where being offended would cause so much damage to an individual in a unique situation that that might not be the case. Right. But it would be, an, uh, it would be a rare exception, not a norm. Yeah, uh, understood. Well, you know, uh, as a libertarian, I, I'm, I would presume that you're familiar with J.S. Mill? Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. Nice. Dumb question. <laughs> um, in his uh, essay on liberty, he, has, he, he sums it up, I think, very well. He says that uh, um, if all society is agreed upon the value, beauty, and truth of one proposition, all except one person, he says it becomes even more important that that one heretic be heard, because we could still potentially benefit from his outrage, potentially outrageous or appalling view. Um, it yeah, sounds it's a marketplace of ideas. That's a classic marketplace of ideas. Yes, and, exactly. And I'm, a big believer, I'm a big believer in the marketplace of ideas. We throw ideas out there, we share them, some of them sink, some of them swim. Um, I think one of the problems with our society is we're afraid of offending each other, so we're actually afraid, afraid of engaging with each other. Yeah. yeah and I have wonder, absolutely no problem. Anybody in your audience who disagrees strongly with me, I'm always glad to engage with people as long as they're sincerely interested in learning what I have to say. And I've, I've learned from a lot of people things I didn't, views I did not expect and um, benefited greatly from engagement. I think the key is to have an open mind. I completely agree. And I, I know that you're uh, uh, back in the... In the old days, you were a New York State debate champion, um, and I always <laughs> and I always appreciated the dialectical the dialecticism of of discussion and debate. Most of what I know, I know from talking with people with whom I disagree. Sometimes very violently, right? That's how you learn, and that's how you grow. Um, so I, I would feel as you do. Now, you will undoubtedly be familiar with the famous observation made by Stephen Jay Gould in his book, Rocks of Ages, when he refers to science and religion as belonging to non-overlapping magisteria. Um, and I bring it up, uh, Jacob, to evoke the idea of morality and ethics in religion. Now, uh, a lot of my viewers had asked me uh, to ask you, sir, does religion or theologically charged moral discernment guide you at all as a bioethicist? Um. The short answer to that 
is, does a particular religious code or creed drive me? Absolutely not. Gr- granted, I, I was raised in a Jewish faith, so I'm very familiar with Jewish tradition. Um, and mm. maybe, not maybe, presumably at some subconscious or internal level, some of those values have suffused my thinking. But I don't sit down and think, what is the Jewish answer to this question ever? Um, but I think most religions are guided by many of the same principles that most secular ethical traditions are guided by, which is figuring out what the right things to do, and figuring out how to help other human beings. Um, and so I think, well, I agree with Stephen Jay Gould in a scientific sense. They're trying to debate things like the origins of the universe based on religion or science is counterproductive. The idea that they are separated in a moral sense is a mistake. Um, I think people who have deep religious faith and people completely secular, agnostic atheists um, may take different paths, but they're often trying to achieve exactly the same end. And I, I feel like that commonality far too often lost on people. Hmm. Understood. Um, so, uh, Jacob, certainly uh, you were the subject of the 2019 documentary uh, entitled Jacob, available on Amazon Prime. And I, I have to tell you, uh, in preparation for this interview, sir, I probably watched it three times in the last uh, three days. <laughs> so I, I, I wouldn't wish that I'm my worst enemy, but, but thank you, too. <laughs> my, 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 life is not, my life is definitely not worth three views. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm very curious. Uh, how did uh, how did that come about? Did the did Mr. Stahl come to you? Did you go to him? How did that all uh, shake down? Uh, Mr. Stahl came to me. John, John is a very good guy and very well intentioned. and made a wonderful film. My understanding is, um, but that all being said, it's his project. People say. I saw your documentary, and I always correct myself. You, you, you saw John's documentary. I'm just a guy who wanders around in it. Um, <laughs> and, really, and, and it's really true. Like, it was his vision. Um, there were some things about me that I think he captured well, and other things that I don't think it necessarily is me. But it's, but it's art and film as much as it is not reality. It's uh, one vantage point. Um, yeah, John had come to me years and years ago, and I let him walk around behind me for a while. But the truth is, I was leading my life doing other things. I didn't really <laughs> think that very many people would see it. Sure. Interesting. Um, yeah, no, I, I enjoyed it. Um, and uh, there was something that came up uh, during, during that documentary, which I actually didn't know about you. Um, and I'm just quite curious. Uh, you're, uh, let me phrase it this way. Um, what led you to want to become a New York City tour guide? Um, so, yeah, so I've always loved New York City. I've always been fascinated by New York City. I'm a lifelong New Yorker. Um, and... I guess when I was, I was writing a book at one point about, um, or starting to write a book about a character who was a New York City tour guide. Um, and I see people often think I became a tour guide to write the book. I actually was starting to write the book already when I became a tour guide because I wanted to have the first hand experience. And I really liked it. I love giving historic tours. I do it very rarely. Um, the one thing, if your audience members want free copies of my of PDFs of my book, electronic copies, and email me, I'm glad to send them. But if they email me asking for tours in New York, I don't do that anymore. Because I get a lot of them, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, if, if I had more bandwidth, I'd be glad to give your family a free tour of New York when you're here. But uh, my patients would not appreciate that. <laughs> Understood. I would agree. <laughs> um, I just have a, a few questions left, sir. Um, sure. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this question might be, you might even laugh at me, given all that you've done. But I'll go ahead and risk it. Um, if you weren't an author, bioethicist, and lawyer, as a matter of fact. Uh, what do you think you would be in life, sir? Um, my father would say very little. Um, but if you're asking more, <laughs> like, what would I like to be if not that? Um, I would definitely say um, uh, Mr. Sophia Loren. Mrs. Yeah. Sophia Loren, that's a good, that's yeah. the best answer I, I, I got. I don't, I don't think, I don't um, think Sophia is going to feel the same way, though, so. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't be Mr. Scarlett. Jo- wouldn't mind being Mr. Scarlett Johansson myself. So I'm, I'm with you. <laughs> um, last question, sir. Uh, has there been a question that hasn't been asked of you that you wish someone would ask? It hasn't been asked to me that I wish someone would ask. Um, that's a really good question. Um, that's a question I always ask the interviewees when I interview yeah. the medical students. Um, but no, you, you, you asked me. I get a wide range of questions and from a lot of people. Um, the, the, the one thing I often get from people, people often ask like something like, well, you seem like a good guy, I like your mission, I watch your documentary, how can I become more involved, etc., and all those hmm. sorts of things. And so what I always tell people is, um, well, I can't give away free hard copies of my books because I'm not wealthy and famous yet, and probably will never be, um, nor am I trying to be. I do have an endless supply of electronic versions, 
So if people email me, they can go to my website and get the email. The website is www.jacobemmapel.com. Glad to send them free PDFs to the number of my books that they can read, they can share. Because the more people who read my ideas and read my fiction, the happier I am. And hopefully they have some positive impact <laughs> on the world, particularly while we're all under quarantine. Beautiful. I love it, Jacob. Um, let me ask it uh, directly. Uh, uh, Dr. Jacob Appel, how can people find out about you? Sure. Um, they can go to my website, www.jacobmappel, all one word, dot com, and there's contact info on the front page. Awesome. Um, Jacob Appel, thank you so much for your time, sir. This was a real pleasure. I can't tell how much I appreciate you uh, taking uh, some time for Absolutely me. Absolutely my pleasure. Really good luck with everything. Good luck with your writing. Thank you so much, Jacob. You take okay. care. Bye-bye. And that was my conversation with Dr. Jacob M. Appel. It was such a pleasure. I really hope you enjoyed it. If you like this interview and you want to see more in the future, um, please feel free. Uh, go ahead and subscribe. Hit that notification bell for Underground. And please don't forget to subscribe to the Unfiltered Podcast with Josh Cohen. Really hope you enjoyed. Really hope you tune in for the next one. Thank you.